Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here in TNO, the last of your which we're playing is everyone's favorites, Gene Kirkpatrick. Gene Kirkpatrick. But um, in the meantime, before we got here, we did play as RFK to get to Kirkpatrick. It is 1973, and this auto completed, but we did get the treaty port return it like a week ago, but I was waiting for them to return once Kirkpatrick was in power, but the Kirkpatrick presidency. For the first time in American history, a woman sits beyond the oaken timbers of the Oval Office at desk. Jean Kirkpatrick has had her detractors, her critics, doubters. She has shown them all to be wrong. They called her too weak for a job or too harsh diplomatically. Diplomatically, They said a woman can never be elected. They belittled everything she did, critiqued what she wore. They said a woman can never win the election, yet she did. In the drawing rooms were Abraham Franklin, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, Abraham Lincoln, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and other great Americans who had once to all, a woman now ponders how to best succeed in their legacy. She thinks about what she has done and what she still has yet to do, yet she has won the people's votes, but has she won their confidence? And internationally speaking, her, her theories, nicknamed the Kirkpatrick Doctrine, are about to be put to the test, but she'll make sure they prove, prove successful. Owen's true place. For centuries. Women are told by men what to do, what to wear, what to sit, what to cook. For centuries, women have been treated as less less than men. And that still continues. Jean Kirkpatrick has heard her fair share of go back to the kitchen in her life, both while in politics and before that. These men, these small, pathetic men, are afraid of strong women. And that is just what Kirkpatrick is. To combat that, the political gap between the sexes, the president decided to embark on a campaign encouraging women to get engaged in politics. Flyers will be printed, speakers hired, classes given, whatever it takes to continue the fight against sexism. For women's place not in the kitchen, it's in the office. President Kirkpatrick's inaugural address. My fellow Americans, Senators and Congressmen, Speaker of the House and Senate, I can only apologize in advance. If for no other reason than my apologies will be rare indeed, because I cannot in good conscience celebrate my presidency with the same exuberance of my colleagues. I fear that I cannot treasure this moment as much as my husband and children surely will. In truth, I cannot stomach it. In the words of Thomas Jefferson, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just and that his justice cannot see forever. It's for this that I cannot and will not treat this moment in time with anything other than the gravity it deserves. My party would have me believe that this marks a new era, a new beginning when, if anything, it is a culmination of everything that has led to my countrymen to this point. To my fellow Americans, to the people of the world and those who have wronged them, in the name of every life ruined by the enemy we face, I offer a clear and undeniable message, not one more. To my fellow Americans, I say to you, uh, do not be afraid. I promise to you that our nation's security will be our highest priority, that the Third Reich and the em our efforts to build a new world order will be in vain, and will be in vain, they will try and fail to preserve it. My promise is an end to uncertainty, and your children will live in the land of their own, safe under the providence of God, and never know fear again. God bless you all, and God bless the United States of America. Hail to the Chief. Jean Kirkpatrick, a major shift in U.S. politics has been, took place in the 1973 presidential election, um, uh, which saw the nomination of liberal Jean Kirkpatrick to the Oval Office, a frightening transformative candidate by just about every measure rare female to wield such authority. Kirkpatrick is noted by external observers for unflinching militarism in the face of the Cold War, combined with the traditional conservative democratic approach to the social policy. Kirkpatrick's election to the presidency clearly marked a turning point with the U.S.'s foreign policy. The new administration would likely see military spending skyrocket along with tensions in Berlin and Tokyo and that whatever incursions await in time, the U.S. is sure to play a more involved role up to the neck and into the death. Hello to the chief and a message from Kennedy to discuss her. Ms. Kirkpatrick, congratulations on your election to the two esteemed office. While never had such opportunity to engage with you or your works, I hear from your associates that you are a well-respected thinker in the field of foreign relations. Our nation will be he will need strong leadership if it survives in the years ahead. While I've done my best of these past eight years, I know more than anyone else that there are storm clouds amassing on every border. To the east are rumblings of war between the reunified Russian government and the Nazi war machine. To the west, China yearns for freedom. To the south, a great number of totalitarian leaders are pursuing new bold ways to oppose the American people and undermine their prosperity. I don't have to use the full mind of the United States of work to address these challenges. Show no fear and take no step back as you work to promote the principles of freedom and liberty. Do not hesitate to call upon me if you have, I can be of any service. Yours, or Robert Kennedy. Round two. You remember that? Please go right ahead. Um, so. And nothing really, uh, uh, interesting there, so. And then, a woman's two plays followed up that CIA Act of 1973. Unions then and now. Through the conflict with both the Reich and the Japan, the Central Intelligence Agency has proven itself invaluable. Protecting America both domestically and abroad, their gears, they are gears in the great machine, yet these gears can be greased to do the job better to do it easier. Jane Kirkpatrick has proposed the CIA Act of 1973 if it passes. The bill allows significantly increased funding for the CIA, along with exempting it from the usual restrictions that come with federal money. Simply said, the CIA will be able to do whatever it needs to. In addition, new pro protocols will be established for those individuals deemed important enough to skip the lengthy immigration process. Perfect for defectors. A tiny Brooklyn apartment. Betty paced in a room, listening to the president speak back and forth, the woman's words soaked into Betty's mind, even if she wasn't actively listening. A million plans were forming, disintegrating in her mind simultaneously. They all amounted to nothing. Well, saying they amounted to nothing isn't exactly fair. They were all building up to something. And she knew what something was. She just had no idea how to get there. There were hundreds of things swirling around in her head, posters, speeches, appointments. She knew that wasn't going to amount to anything, at least not yet. Yet she kept pacing, kept thinking, kept coming with new ideas. New questions kept running through her mind once she hadn't even considered. What would she be? She knew she wouldn't be part of the MPP, but she wasn't sure whether to register as a Republican or Democrat. Her entire family had been Republicans for as long as she could remember, but the internationalism, or interventionism, that pres the President and her Labor Democrats preached offered an appealing alternative. 
They also have the question of her slogan. She wanted to be a pun of some sort. She always loved puns and thought it was the best way to get her message out. She was thinking along the lines of, a vote for a diamond can't be harder, as they've been her last name in it, and it was funny. So she'd give that one a bit more thought. Her thoughts were interrupted by yell, Betty, what are you pacing around up there for? I'm running for office, of course. Unions now and then and now. President Kirkpatrick's Vice President Leonard Woodcock, as a union man through and through, as one of the most important members of the United Auto Workers, is devoted to the cause of the working class, a cause that he and Gene Kirkpatrick worked valiantly to fight for. Woodcock would give a series of speeches emphasizing the importance of unions, weaving a tapestry of their history, and I could continue. Many women across the U.S. must fight together and for each other with Kirk. Cock, Woodcock and Kirkpatrick oh, as right. their nights. Goodbyes were never easy. That was a lesson that Ryan was quickly learning, or one that was finally setting him, obviously. He lived through some hard goodbyes, saying goodbye to his mother right before college, or to his best friend as he moved across the country to the uncharted wasteland known as Louisiana. This goodbye was different. He knew it, and his girlfriend knew it, the friends knew it, they weren't going to see Ryan for a long time, and there was a chance he'd never see him again. Oh, his mother screamed and cried, but what mother would him? He was joining the military, he was going to brought it by the forces of evil. Ryan didn't know if joining the military was the correct term, per se. Of course, he was joining an armed force that defends liberty, but not under jurisdiction of the United States. He wouldn't even necessarily be answering to an American. He might be after taking orders from an Australian, a Canadian, or even Kiwi, and a number of other groups of people. Ryan was joining the organization Free Nations Peacekeeping Corps. He'd been wearing the signature blue beret, be serving along with the best of the best as freedom's bulwark. He was ready to do whatever to, to protect and spread freedom and democracy. He was already in peak physical condition. He had been training for some time of some sort of military service for his entire life, but he only just recently became confident in which. President Kirkpatrick's increased OFN recruitment drives ensured of a place in the Corps. He was an able-bodied man who could shoot a rifle. They wouldn't say no. Ryan's story was unfolding around America as well as other mem member states of the OFM. President Kirkpatrick was reinforced trust in the alliance as well as relations between the member states. From L.A. to Denver to Canberra to Christchurch, young men were flocking to the Blue Banner of Liberty. I'll root the enemy here. A weed is growing in the United States. A disgusting rotten weed. Its name? The Sovereignist Caucus. Part of uh, the disgusting chimera that is the MPP, the Sovereignist Caucus for the preservation of white and Christian America. They're not patriots. No, they're the opposite. They run rather beneath. Uh, the swastika then the before beneath the stars and stripes. They are fascists through and through. We must be dealt with accordingly. We will not ban them. We will not stop to stoop their level. And so put out a series of attacks ads portraying them as Nazi bootlickers they are. Despite France Spark Yaki losing the election, he still has an influence. The influence that must be dealt with. Which I never under really understood personally, like in here, like yeah, there's literally no popularity here. Literally no popularity. And yeah, I did manipulate this a little bit, but like even before we we don't manipulate it. Like it it's, it's still not an issue, but you know, whatever. The Act of the CIA Act of 1973 passes as uh, one of the more controversial members measures of Kirkpatrick's first hundred days. The CIA Act of 1973 is passed and is now headed to the Oval Office. In a statement, President Kirkpatrick has said she was pleased by Congress expediting the bill to provide urgent and necessary action to protect our national security. The CIA Act was widely praised by many of Kirkpatrick's national security-oriented supporters. With saw removing red tape that had strung the agency and made it harder to do its job, but and tried to controversy. Mr. Sellers removing unnecessary oversight from the organization with a checkered past. Regards, the president's arguments carried the day, and the new administration secured a major success in its first few days. Let's get down to business. More war sport encryption, decryption, civilian intelligence, army intelligence. Re replace rule of engagement with no restrictions. We lose it. leader experience gain. War sport. Resistance growth speed goes up. Merely moderately shift to support of the National Caucus. Oh, that's cool. Unions then and now. Where the sun shines less. Many people see the U.S. armed forces as a front line against fascism around the world, exactly as they should. Yet just behind the scenes lies the Central Intelligence Agency doing the things that need to be done to protect freedom. Sometimes honorable, sometimes unsavory, the men and women of the CIA will do whatever it takes to promote liberty. Gene Kirkpatrick has authorized the construction of dozens of black sites, CIA operation centers located around the world. From England to Turkey to Russia to China, these little tiny black sites will be the heart of which the American, the blood of America is pumped. When's it change? Tommy leaned lean against the wall, staring, can make take his eyes out the poster that was in front of him. It wasn't a large poster, no, not at all, but its very existence was an attack on him. On what he believed as part of the president, uh, Kirkpatrick's crusade against fascists both abroad and within America, various com companies began to print a series of attack ads targeting the sovereignist faction of the National Progressive Act, of which Tommy was a part of. Tommy had to admit, it was a good-looking poster. The background was an American flag in front of it, an African-American man shaking hands with a white man. The both man's, men's heads were, together we can be fascism. A smaller words below it, there were more. If you think you or someone may have been radicalized by the MPP, it's not too late. Call 555-Quadruple-X. Beneath that was a small wasp, white, small wasp, swaska, swaska, with a massive X going through it. A pang went through the heart when he saw the swaska. Tommy wasn't a Nazi after all, or at least he didn't think he was. Sure, some people in the party might have been, some extreme views, but they would mellow out if they ever got elected. No, Tommy was afraid. He was afraid of the Japanese stealing his jobs and the Jew stealing his wife. Yet he wasn't a Nazi. Did the people think he was a Nazi? He had been called a Nazi, of course, although Franz Sparkyaki had lost, he had been a Nazi. Uh, after months of hesitation, he wrote down the poster. He hoped they'd pick up his call to change human nature. Oh, unlike her grandfather, Jean Kirkpatrick was never a socialist nor a communist. While she heavily supported labor unions and has a great deal of respect for those that go by the social democratic label, communism and socialism are things that she cannot abide. Not in her America. Not 
While not as open as bodies of sovereigns, the Marxists of the Empire are their own unique kind of people. One of the mass graves is helping the working class. It's a snake that must be dealt with, of course. And we'll fight this viper the same way that we fight sovereign sovereigns. Sovereigns and assault by advertisement. Broken knows it again. Once the Again, the round, the sound of knuckles on bone bone rang out from the small room. A sound that recently become very complex to everyone in the room. As common as the rhythmic humming of the fluorescent light in the background of an incessant stream of questions. Elias tried to think of where it could be. The operative word, of course, being tried. He wasn't able to do much of anything other than whimper. It may, while he may have been able to think when they first brought him to his place, the facilities have since left him. The endless barrage of blows ensured that he couldn't think about anything, not anything besides the seemingly endless stream of blood that was rolling down his chin. He didn't sign up for this, at least he didn't think so. When he joined the Wehrmacht, it was because he had no other option. He, like so many other young men, had no other path in front of him, so he heeded the call of the fatherland, but only for a job. Apparently, the CIA didn't see it that way. Again and again, they had asked him questions, questions he had no answer to, questions he would refuse to answer, and questions he had no answers at all. He barely remembered being captured. It was in Iran, definitely, but everything after that was blurry. He had no idea where he was. The men and women all around him spoke English, although their German was also remarkably good. But that didn't necessarily mean anything, after all. Everyone knows the CIA has sites all over the world for detaining people like him. People like him, you had no idea what that meant. Nazis? Germans? Enemies of the United States? You couldn't tell. He was a German shirt, but he wasn't a Nazi. It matters not. The tool for America. The leaders lead, followers follow. The greatest post war success. Of all the developments that emerged from the Second World War and its immediate aftermath, the Organization of Free Nations was by far the most important. A League of Nations, united by the wings of the Reich's eagles and the rays of the Japanese sun, bound not by the chains of conquest, but by the promise to fight for one another. From South Africa to Indonesia to the Middle East, the elephant sent men and machines, bullets and bloods, the soldiers of free nations around the world have fought for liberty. Sometimes victorious, sometimes not, the OFN has been hardened in the hottest fire and has emerged as the hardest steel. It has been forged into a blade of democracy to defend it, to protect it, and to spread it. Jean Kirkpeck will put the blade to a grindstone, she will hold the blade to a fine point. Uh, and when use it where she must, to this end she will give an address both to the nation and the OFN, stressing the importance of mutual cooperation and appealing to the closer bonds between the nations. And look at do this one too, and this one as well. Why enlarge the OFN? The Organization of Free Nations is an alliance of nations willing to do whatever it takes to fight fascism. From Washington to Ontario to Canberra, the blue flag waves and blazes them with a torch, the fires of the liberty stands out for all to see. It's not enough, as many nations pledge allegiance to the OFN, it's still not enough. Take more than existing members to defeat both the Hun and the Samurai far more. For this reason, Gene Kirkpatrick argues that we should seek to invite more members to the Alliance. While it be difficult to do, we must streamline the application process to make future expansion easier. The greatest post-war success. Arnold's getting more and more used to Australia. It was a beautiful country, one, that constantly surprised him and impressed him. It was no America, of course, but it was still a strong arm of the free world. He'd only been living on the base for six months, but he could hardly feel himself starting to pick up some Aussie slang, much to his wife's amusement. As part of the Organization of Free Nations Detachment, his job was constantly changing, and this time it was stationed in a small military base in New South, New South Wales, a beautiful part of the country. There's no combat in the specific role, obviously, but that didn't mean he wasn't ready for it. He served in South Africa, he served in Indonesia. He'd won the OFM uh, blue on the both occasions, he had fought alongside Aussies, Canadians, Brits, and Kiwis. He knew how hard they fought and how committed they were to the cause of liberty, but Sparta called them brothers and fought by their sides. As much as he loved it where he was, he didn't mean he missed his home any less. That little Manhattan apart in the shoal, the shoal around the corner, he missed it so much, he even missed the politics of it all, kind of. He always did his duty, he voted for the candidate that would support the Organization of Free Nations the most. In 72, that had been Gene Kirkpatrick, and he would have been seen returns to the OFM. Fighting had increased, as well as improved international cooperation. Arnold wasn't a man who regretted much, he never once regretted joining the military, nor enlisting the OFM detachment. He didn't regret voting for Gene Kirkpatrick either, even as the protests back home grew louder. He was proud of his country, and proud of himself, he wore the OFM blue with pride, for freedom everywhere, and the Kirkpatrick Doctrine realized. Gene Kirkpatrick has invented what is commonly called the Kirkpatrick Doctrine. This theory calls for the support of authoritarian regimes opposed to totalitarian ones. In essence, its goal is to defeat the German Reich and the Japanese Samurai by enemies necessary. A communist dictatorship may be a dictatorship, but they oppose the Reich, and for that, that's all it takes. Guns and aid will be sent all over the world to any groups that oppose our enemies, be they Islamists, socialists, criminal or otherwise, other, whatever it takes. Fascism must be defeated, even if it takes up giving some dignity. Al Alhamdulillah. A final eulogy for the Kennedy administration? If you're worried about that, please go ahead. Yay. And the fires of liberty ready to spread. The fires of liberty have never gone out. They may have been dimmed, dampened, or diminished, but no more. Jinx Kirkpatrick has had a few of these fires, ensuring that these roaring blaze are stronger than ever. They have not uncontrolled rage. It is confined. It is careful. The fires of freedom will spread, but they will not consume. Unlike the fires of the Reich, they will not ruin or kill. The fires of freedom will light. Like Lady Liberty's torch, Kirkpatrick and America will be the bearers of this flame. He's going to set the world on fire. From that fire, stronger, better world will emerge. As he died to make men holy, let us die to make men free. Time to get our hands dirty. Alhamdulillah. In a small cave outside of Shali, Chechnya, a group of men huddled around a large box. 
The clamor of voices came to a crescendo before their leader, a man tall with a rifle, motioned for silence. When he had everyone's attention, he began the process of opening the box. It was a long process. Or the journey, the hinges are already slightly fatigued, causing a truly horrendous scraping noise. The noise and the trouble was worth it, however. As the man looked into the box, his eyes widened and he began to pray. He was looking upon an arsenal fit for a king, rows and rows of the newest rifles, the rocket propelled grenades that could destroy even the most hardy panzer, and countless other tools of destruction for use against the Reich's monsters and clothes with a note. More on the way. In Manchuria, a group of rebels trained on the newest American rifle platform, and in Libya, a crowd of Islamic socialists listening to a CIA dispatch explained the specific instructions for flying a Huey. In Nicaragua, a group of gangsters took turns aiming down the sights of a mortar. As part of this application of the Kirkpatrick Doctrine, the Central Intelligence Agency has been sending arms and aid to anyone who stands against Nazi or Japanese oppression. Regardless of their own politics, all over the world the same story unfolds. Men and women fighting their own battles suddenly find themselves aided by the largest intelligence agency in the world. From monarchists to communists to Islamists, the CIA is making new friends. Who knows how many they'll be able to keep? Keep friends? What is that? 26 billion? Not enough. And we only got up to 564 billion in GDP, but whatever. That's okay. Um, but yeah, overall, not bad. We have a national healthcare system. Oh, and Italy just took towards African interventions, which I still need to play with those African things. But Lady Liberty's Torch. Inside every American, there's a fire. Some days, a fire burns bright and shines through. The darkness promising to light up the world with the flame of liberty and freedom. Other days, it's dim. The last embers of a dying flame glowing faintly yet soldiering on. Maybe President Jean Kirkpatrick found this flame a roaring bonfire, maybe due to the past administration's failure. She found it more as an embers that she had nurtured back to life. It doesn't matter how she found it, it matters now whether she inherited a couple sparks of raging inferno, she had turned into a blazing pyre, a beacon for the oppressed people around the world. Lady Liberty holds her torch high, the fire shining to every corner of the map, from Germany to Tokyo, from DC to Canberra, from Rome to Jerusalem, the world is illuminated. Like a moth to a flame, many women are drawn to freedom. The men and women of the Organization Free Nation see the flame, they heat its light, and, then so, and they go to it. Every day more people join the armies of freedom, be it by joining the United States Army, the New Zealand Defense Force, the Central Intelligence Agency, or countless other organizations they listen to its cl clarion call. While the roar of the flame grows louder, so too does the roar of the crowd. Some, of course, are in sport. Crowds with blue elfin banners are a frequent sight outside the White House, showing support for the Gene Kirkpatrick. But they, too, have those face off against. They have those they face off against. The honest crowds of pacifists and cowards who show up outside the White House. They think that the United States of America should not fight the Nazis or the samurai. Instead, they should be bent over backwards to the fascists. Gene Kirkpatrick will not listen to them. The Torch of Liberty will burn until every man breathes free, which is the end, unfortunately, for Jean Kirkpatrick. She seems like she wants to be very, very aggressive. But if you'd like to read about her, please go ahead. She's from Oklahoma. But if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow in another video or campaign. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.